In this week's episode, we talk about men's ideal form of masculinity, Jordan Peterson, and uh, Mr. Cosby. Welcome to the Ask a Matchmaker podcast. I'm your host, Matchmaker Maria. I don't know why I'm saying my name like that, but that's fun. This week's guest is Christine Emba. Hey, thanks she, for having me. Yeah, you are a columnist at the Washington Post. Mm -hmm. You've come up here from DC. I have. And she, you had your first book come out, Rethinking Sex. Rethinking Sex, a provocation. We have to talk about it. Of course. Uh, and you have also been named one of the world's top 50 thinkers by, was it Parade, no, Prospect Magazine? By Prospect, yeah. It's a Dude, magazine in the UK. That's pretty cool, though, because unite, Americans really trust British opinions. And if you don't believe me, look at America's Got Talent. I know. If only I had a British accent to go with it, honestly. I feel like that's what Americans really You know, love. people don't realize how dumb some British people are because of their accent. True. <laughs> Factually accurate. Like, people will tell me, like, I've heard women say, like, oh, I want to do some of the British accent. And I'm like, okay, that doesn't mean anything. It's just an accent. It'll just, like, make you feel better when he's saying something kind of ridiculous to you, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Who among us? <laughs> uh, well, Christine, I am obsessed with you because as someone who reads the Washington Post every morning, I like that is like literally my daily routine at 7 a.m. Thank you for keeping me in a job. <laughs> yes. I proud subscriber. Proud subscriber. I, um, I learned about you because you have a column mm -hmm. and your column is about my favorite topic of all single men. <laughs> but it's from a way different stance of what I'm promoting it as. You look at single men from the lens of like, what's what's going on? What's the status of these dudes? What's happening? Something is off. How yes. did you, how did you get yourself this position? <laughs> well, I mean, I should clarify that I'm not just the single men columnist. No, no, no. You Post, also have. But yes. my beat is, my beat is ideas in society and culture, which is, you know, kind of broad enough to almost be a little bit of everything. But I'm really interested in kind of social relationships and interactions, how we relate to each other, what we owe each other, what the society we're building will look like. Um, and so I think I, it took a little, I sort of got onto this beat almost by accident, the sort okay. of men and women and relationships uh, beat, but. But did the know, book come first? The or? book, so the book came first. So, oh. you know, the Me Too moment was happening in 2018. Um, I wrote columns just about like the, the concept of consent, how to think through some of the cases. Like I wrote a column on um, uh, Harvey Weinstein. I feel like I read some of those columns too, where you were talking about like the intersection of Me mm -hmm. Too with a like many scopes. Yeah, and with, you know, sort of real life. I realized that I was interested in not just kind of the obvious cases, sort of like Harvey Weinstein, rapist, bad guy, but stories like- That should be the name of the episode. <laughs> Harvey Weinstein, rapist, bad guy. <laughs> Um, but I, do you remember the story Cat Person in the New Yorker? No. Okay. It was a short story um, that was told from like the near third person about a woman, a college woman who goes on a date with an older guy. She sleeps with him even though she doesn't really want to. Yeah. And, we've all been there. Yeah. And it kind of feels like gross about it. And then the story ends. That's basically the whole story. But it became the New York, the New Yorker magazine's like most read piece of short fiction ever. And it was because women, like especially millennial women and younger women were like, oh yeah, yeah, me too. That, sure, that makes You just sense. saw my natural reaction to <laughs> no, you even saying that. Like, exactly, yeah, happened. It, okay, we're here now, can't say no. Right, and so I was just so interested in that. Like how did we get there to the place where like this sort of sad experience is commonplace for, you know, young women and young men. And I, I found that kind of like the personal, the sort of everyday story, almost more interesting than, you know, the big obvious cases. And so I ended up expanding some of those columns into my book, Rethinking Sex, um, which basically sort of questions what I think are potentially false assumptions that we have made or accepted post in the sort of like post-feminist, post-sexual revolution moment. And, you know, ask the question of, whether we ended up where we thought we would end up, whether the, you know, the feminist movement and the sexual revolution happened, we had our sort of years of girl bossery. Are we happy now? And if not, did we lean in we too hard to change? <laughs> did we lean in too hard and kind of like fall over basically? And did we? 
I, you know, I think on, on some on some levels, yes. I think that we kind of deceived ourselves about some some well, clear truth. Let's take a step back because I don't want to go into the conclusion yes. yet. Okay. So when before when you were saying about that story, right? The cat story. Yeah. Um, and my natural reaction is like, who hasn't been there? Which is to me, when I think about that moment, is you had a great night, or you had not even a great night, you had a good date. Yeah. Um, you drank maybe one drink too much because it was just a good date, not yeah. a great date. Um, you liked the attention, you liked getting kissed, but now you're in a place where it's like, well, I had no intention of sleeping with you, but it's going to be way more energy to explain why I don't want to mm -hmm. sleep with you. So I'm just going to sleep with you. And the only time I thought that was like a Maria experience. And the only time where I was like, oh, this must be happening to other women is, do you know what, what I'm about to say? I don't. This is kind of like a big story, but it's funny because I've talked to other women about this and they were like, yeah, that's literally what I thought too, is when, who's the porn star that, Stormy Daniels. Uh -huh. When Stormy Daniels talks huh. about being with President Trump. Trump before he became president, she mentions something like, well, what did I get myself into now? Like, that's literally the quote she yes. says. Yeah. And she's like, I guess we'll do it. You know, and it's like, yeah, that's like the most relatable sentence ever. And it's like, did I, I mean, I'm obviously a fully consenting woman. It's just like, I cannot envision a place where a man is like, well, I guess I'm here. <laughs> Have well, to go as well with fuck. it. You know? So yeah, I'd love to know, like, what did you learn in the book? Like in rethinking sex mm -hmm. and in consent and in this, how we're socialized and I know we're speaking heteronormally right now, but how we're socialized as women, like, what did you learn? What were your, what were your findings? Yeah, no, I mean that, like that moment is what I, I interviewed so many women and men for the book and moments like that were so common as to be the norm. And the fact that that's the norm just made me really sad, but also curious about how we got here. And I mean, the first thing, I think one big conclusion that I drew from the book um, and from my research is that consent just isn't enough actually yeah I mean, someone signing a contract is not right i mean obviously consent is key consent is important we have to have it it took us a long time to get to the place where we could even say you have to give consent but consent is a floor right it was never meant to be a ceiling i think most people even men and women want more <sighs> from their sexual encounters and to be like i did not criminally assault someone tonight like okay <laughs> great <laughs> fine but to actually have good sex, by which I mean, you know, ethical sex, like sex that's good for you and the other person, hopefully physically, but also morally, like in a way that you can feel good about as a human being, you have to go past just getting them to like sign the contract. And what I what I what I uh, use as the term in the book is will the good of the other, which means care about the other person's experience, at least attempt to as much as you care about your own value their good as highly as you value your own. And then that implies some other things, right? You have to maybe know the person well enough to be able to have some idea of what their good might be. You also have to have an idea of what the good is in this encounter that you're having in sex. Like, what are you trying to do here? What does a relationship mean to you? What does sex mean to you? We actually need to sort of think about these things. And one of the things that I found so fascinating in talking to people for this book was that so many of us never stop to think about it. Like yeah. I would ask people, okay, like what what is what is sex? What what do you want from sex? And they'd be like, I don't know. Like I, I just never took the time to think about it. And so I just sort of go through the motions that it seems like everybody is doing this. So I I just do it. And like that was another thing too that you know, I realized with research and interviews and reporting is just women and men are different, I think. And we're speaking sort of in a heteronormative, yeah. heteronormative sense. You know, obviously there are gender by like gender non-binary people, people mm -hmm. who don't fit this norm. But, you know, women are socialized to be agreeable, to be Give compliant, in. to say yeah. yes. And so even in situations where someone says yes, where there's consent, that doesn't necessarily mean that 
it's the enthusiastic. Was enthusiastic that it was well, good that it was enough. In your interviews of the people that were like, "Well, I guess I'm here, I'm going to do it." Did any of these people get into relationships with because I any time I've ever thought that I'm not dating this person. I'm not I'm just like, "All right, I'm in a pickle." Yeah. Like it's easier to just do this than Yeah, right. It's like, "Well, I mean, I guess we're in his house now. Like what am I going to do? Like leave?" Um I which by the way, which is so sad. Saying this out loud right now on a microphone, like, is blowing my mind because it's kind of like, it's icky. Yeah. It's like. It's not great. It's like, it's like two sentences away from like, yeah, I was cool with being raped. Like, that's literally, like, that's how, it's not rape. Yeah. But it's like, mm, basically, that's what you were scared of. Yes. Yeah. Because that's, that's, that's why you agree to it. Because you're like, it's, cause it's like, you're like, well, okay, I'm here now because for the most part, you're like, well. I could go home or I'm scared of their reaction yeah. if I turn around right now. Which it could be violent or it could just be like you have to get into some sort of extended dialogue about We have to go on another date now with a person that I'm really not enthusiastic about. This is why. Do you know that I have the 12 date rule? Have you heard of this yeah, thing? Yeah, I have. Dude, let me tell you, not a single day goes by. Not a single day goes by where I don't get a text message or some video or someone who's like, I got engaged because of the 12 day rule. Because you take sex off the table and it's like, oh, now I don't have... You don't have this feeling of like, well, I guess I'm here. I guess we'll keep doing this. I guess we'll keep really doing this. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, and that goes to the sort of like, oh, what does it take to get to know someone, get to know their intentions, get to know yours, right. figure out what the match is about before moving forward. But I mean, I, I, really quick, if you are a new listener to this podcast and you don't know what 12 date rule is, follow me on Instagram. There's a whole highlight reel there. That's called 12 date rule. <laughs> With all the thank yous. Read it up. It has thank yous at the end. You've been on it, huh? I have. It, dude, I, I have so many I have not posted. You have no idea. Like not a That's single incredible. day. I am like so proud of this. By the way, big fan of hoe phasing too. I'm just not a fan of like, well, I guess we'll, I guess we're here now sex, you know, it's, well, it's like the worst sex. So that was the other thing. And it's always, and it's like, if you come, like if you orgasm, excuse me, um, it's like, you're kind of surprised. You're like, oh. Like, wow, okay, yeah, that was bonus, nice. I guess. That was nice, you know? <laughs> I mean, Good for other, me. <laughs> the other thing that I, I, I guess, realized, even though I, I sort of knew it, one of these kind of almost false assumptions that I think that a lot of young women are socialized into is sort of this idea of the hoe phase, frankly. Yeah. Like, there is an assumption that a lot of young women especially, but also men, but especially women feel that like to be sort of a good, liberated, modern woman, you need to participate. You should be having sex. You should be yeah. having lots of it. You should be up for experimentation, and up for anything. And if you're not having fun, it's because there's something wrong with you. Like you're a prude or something like, why? Right. I don't understand. Like, what, what are you complaining about? Right. Like women should be able to hook up like men and sort of that's behave a very like the worst sex kind in the city dude. 2002 mentality it is. like yeah. i don't this is i don't it's not about me personally relating to this or you personally relating to this but i do think that there is there is this promotion of like this is the way to have sex like right. hoe phasing is the way to have sex which by the way i'm a big fan of the hoe phase if you want to do that to someone which Again, it's not a verb. It's not an. It's it's not. It's not. It's not a. It's not a judgment. Okay. It's just going out on a date with someone without the idea that this is going to be your boyfriend. Right. You could just have fun and see where it goes. Right. And maybe it just goes to sex. Maybe they're just not going to be your husband. That is okay. Right. But this idea that like, if you're not like it's exactly what you're saying. If you're not experimenting, you've done it wrong. And it's like, well, you could have fun experimenting in other ways that don't necessarily create penetrative sex yeah yeah and this idea of like kind of also not having feelings that like women should be able to just that's really be tough the cool by the way girl to as one <laughs> you're quoting gone girl now i am but i'm also actually quoting like a woman who i interviewed in the book who you know talked about how she had sort of taken in this idea that she should be able to fuck without feelings to take the power back that men that's had biologically not possible right and <laughs> i guess like this is another one of these assumptions that i that i wanted to challenge or like provoke in this book like we tell ourselves this but then in our in our relation in our relational lives in our sex lives 
so many women are like, well, I'm, I'm trying not to have feelings, but I have feelings. You're like, I'm, I'm trying to fuck like a dude. This is but why you cannot I hold can't. face with someone that you like. You have to hold face with someone who like morally is so repulsive <laughs> that it stops the oxytocin from like fleeing. Because I get messages all the time from women who are like, I have feelings with my, fu- you know, my w- FWB. What should I do? My friends with benefits. What should I do? And I'm like, if they wanted to date, they'd be dating you. You wouldn't be friends with benefits. Yeah. So like you're in a pickle now. So yeah. Find the morally repulsive man. <laughs> That's who you have sex with. <laughs> Except, do you really want to do something? And Just this is once. another thing. Sex maybe is serious. Like with a morally repulsive person or someone you actually yeah. can't trust. Like does sex actually mean something? In which case. No, I get what you're what saying. Do, what do we think about? I love, I love that you're coming here from like a well-read perspective because oh, it's just like so wonderful. Um, when you were doing your interviews recently, you posted an article over the summer where you interviewed a bunch of men. Yes. About masculinity. Is that am I wrong here? Pretty much. Yeah. So, okay. So in in writing rethinking sex, I spoke to women and and men. Um, And I think that women's stories inform the book more because I was kind of writing from the woman's perspective and sort of saying, you know, you're not crazy. This thing that you think is off in our culture, in our sexual culture is off. It's not just you. (laughs) Something is going on here. But I was fascinated by what I heard from the guys I talked to. And the main sort of vibe that I felt from them was actually just a, a general sense of confusion a sense of like lostness, like Like they didn't really know how to be. So I was doing a lot of interviews after Me Too, right? Mm -hmm. And I talked to so many men who were like, well, like, I don't know, am I allowed to talk to women now? Should I not? Like they they want me to be feminist, but like they don't. And like, there's one guy who said something I would, I'm never going to forget. He was like, you know, I, I, I would never like go up to a woman and ask her out now. Like, asking out a woman in you my office. You don't think it's that's like, weird? It's like handing someone a loaded shotgun. I was like, it's very extreme. Oh. <laughs> so I know you're a journalist and you have journalist integrity, okay? Mm-hmm. But when you hear a man say, oh, now I'm scared of talking to women, I'm like, I'm scared of you because you just said that. <laughs> like, you don't know how to talk to another human being without, like, assaulting them or yeah. making them feel uncomfortable. Well, that was, like, kind of the thing. It was... It wasn't even, I mean, there are definitely some people who are like, oh, like I I would never go out on a woman now because I can't sleep with her. And it's like, okay, maybe you shouldn't be doing that anyway. Like, I don't want to go out with you. But there was a sense of like guys who had grown up thinking that they should maybe be a man in some sort of way. And then that option, like those options didn't really feel available to them in the same way. And so they were kind of lost in like giving up almost. There were also guys who were like, well, I you know, my job isn't attractive enough or whatever. And so I like, I'm never going to get a girlfriend. I'll just like, I just watch a lot of porn, I guess. And in general, I think there have been so many social shifts over the past 50 years, you know, many of them awesome, right? Like women have broken down barriers. They're in the workplace. They're highly educated. They're making money. Um, they're allowed to have bank accounts. They're allowed, to, yeah. We're allowed to buy in the houses. Seventies, yeah. Like pretty, I told my dad. I told my dad yesterday. I was like, "Do you know that, like, you know, a woman could not have a bank account until the seventies? And my dad's like, "What? Like, he was so he didn't even realize his he own. didn't even realize it was that recent. Yeah. Uh, and I think for me, um, I watched. What was that movie about Ruth, ba- Ruth Bader Ginsburg? Um, on, the on the basis, basis of, of sex. sex. Oh on the basis my of sex. god! Yeah. I watched that movie on the plane when it had first come out. It just happened to be on a plane. Yeah, and I was like, this movie should be required watching for like every high schooler. Like yeah. every senior in high school needs to watch this movie because we in 2023 as women, we really take for granted, forget, and forget yeah. like how recent this is. Yeah. No, totally. And like, these are great changes, especially for women. But they've left, I think, a lot of men feeling sort of unsure of where they fit in the world. So I mean, some statistics, generally, uh, for every 100 bachelor's degrees from college that women get now, men get 74. And the proportion is dropping. There's this piece in 
a competitor publication, the New York Times, a couple of weeks ago about how many colleges are doing like sneak affirmative action for men because otherwise the gender balance on campus is totally skewed. I think they quoted one of my previous guests, John Berger, from oh, the book yeah. Datanomics, yep. mm -hmm. where he talks about this. And uh, I'm not surprised. But it's also like I think what John Berger says is like there needs to be mixed collared dating. Mm -hmm. uh, so like blue collar, white collar. But that's also, you know, teaching women like, like that they should be open to that, that you need to possibly be open if you are interested in having a life mate. But even when you do that, right, I mean, you also look at the percentage of men in the labor force. So, again, over the past, like less than 50 years, like 30 years, the labor force has gone from having kind of a steady set of sort of labor jobs, right? Like jobs that were traditionally geared towards men to being focused on automation, like free trade has taken jobs overseas, jobs that pay well are often sort of credentialed jobs. And right. so a lot of men are dropping out of the workforce. Like actually the the age range that has the most men dropping out of the workforce completely is from 25 to 34, like prime working age men. <laughs> and Did you see uh, at the time of this recording, um, the New York Times, the daily podcast, mm -hmm. the episode this week was, is college even worth it? That was the name of the episode. And I was just like, Jesus, yeah. like, <laughs> you know, okay. Like, uh. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, it seems like, for a lot of men, for a lot of American men, they had kind of been socialized into this idea that they should be, you know, a protector, a provider, a procreator, but women are earning as much as they are now. Like the jobs that they thought they would have haven't necessarily materialized. There's been this pushback to the idea that men can kind of like do whatever they want, the patriarchy. Yeah. Feminists are finally coming forward. And it's left a lot of men feeling confused, frankly, like unsure of who their role models are and what it means to be a guy in so, the world today. Now that you said the role models in a recent column that you wrote in the Washington Post, girl, I'm obsessed with you. <laughs> okay. I love it. You talked about those male role models. Mm -hmm. And one of them was the name uh, Jordan. Jordan Peterson. Peterson, who's like a big freaking deal. Like a I didn't realize deal. how huge he was in men who are seeking role models. Yeah. And you know, to me, I think what I found very interesting in the article, and I want you to talk about it too, is like, was it a therapist that was recommending it too? Yeah. And I was just like, what? Like, I, it just like blew my mind, like how you were even able to get people quoting saying these things. Yeah. I so mean, let's, let's talk about who he is first. Yeah. And then, so, yeah. <laughs> right. So then there are also just like a lot of young men who are frankly growing up without father figures or male role models in their homes or in their communities. And they're sort of trying to figure out on their own how to be a man, a man. in 2023. Yeah. And there's there's kind of a vacuum, you know, of people who will tell them how to do that. And one of the people who has stepped in to fill that vacuum in a really intense way is this guy, Jordan Peterson. Um, so he was originally a psychology professor at like a Canadian university, and he became famous um, for sort of culture warring, basically. Like but, what? Um, I think like the conflict that made him famous was that he refused to use someone's preferred pronouns in his class or something. Ugh, and then he so, was like, so annoying. censured. Yeah, it's like very yeah. unnecessary. Um, it's like then you're just looking for drama. Yeah, exactly. Like, okay. But someone, he, someone in his class would have, I, I bet you in that same classroom, he like did roll call the first day and some guy was like, he said like Michael Smith. And he's like, you could just call me Mike. And he's like, you got sure. it. Sure. In that same class, <laughs> there's just no way there was not a Michael and a Christopher who were like, just call me Mike. Just call me Chris. Call and me whatever like, fake name. Yeah. yeah it's like, ugh, no, okay. totally like groping for conflict. But he wrote this book uh, called 12 Rules for Life, an, an, an Antidote to Chaos, which became like a massive, a runaway bestseller in 2018. And so this was also when I was researching for Rethinking Sex, but I was like so interested in this guy who had become... A YouTube sensation. So he would like put his lectures on YouTube and young men were watching them. And then his book came out and like millions of copies sold and it was out of nowhere. And so I, I was like, okay, I'll go like see who this guy is. And you went to I a went seminar. to a stop on his book tour. Right. Okay. And it was a fascinating experience. First of all, what was the gender breakdown at this? So the gender breakdown was probably 85% men okay. and 15% women. And the women were all 
like either moms who had brought their sons in hopes that Jordan Peterson would teach them something or guys who had been brought by their like long suffering girlfriends. And I went actually with a colleague of mine at the Washington Post, a, a guy a my gentleman? age. Okay. And everyone just thought it was his girlfriend <laughs> there to support him. Okay. Um, and then so the, you're saying there was no single women there. There were there were no single women there. And then what is the age breakdown at this book? I mean, it was mostly young men. It was like teenagers to teenagers. Maybe, teenagers to maybe like mid thirties, I would say. Or Thank like you a little for bit taking younger. one for the teen, by the way. <laughs> All right. So tell us what it was like. Um I mean, it was kind of bizarre, like Jordan Peterson, you know, first of all, another weird experience, I was kind of joking about it, like in my seat before it started, you know, who's this guy? I read the book beforehand and the, the 12 rules for life. What did you think like, of the book? It, I, it felt like information that you should have gotten from your dad or your, your grandfather, like <laughs> frankly, what? his most famous rule is uh, clean your room. Okay. Like, oh, wow, clean your room. Fascinating. Don't tell lies. Um, but there's a lot of, like, evolutionary psychology kind of weird stuff. Like, do you know that lobsters are like humans and that all of the female lobsters are attracted to the top the lobster? The top one, I've seen that and one, yeah. human women also love the top lobster. And so I was like, yeah, The problem is that this. we define lobsters very differently. very differently. But this guy turned around and was like, Jordan Peterson taught me how to live. Someone said that to you. Yes. To your face. Yes. Taught you how to live. Yes. Like a 20 something year old guy like whipped around in his chair and told me that. And I was like, okay. You weren't wearing a press badge. No, I was just there like maybe making fun of Jordan Peterson too loudly <laughs> from my seat. But you know, the, the show begins, Jordan Peterson strides onto the stage in his like three piece suit or whatever, glares at the audience. And it's like, glares. Yeah. This is like his affect. He's like the tough uncle. And it's like, who are you? Who are you really? Do you know what it takes to be a man? Like, you know, really performative stuff. But the audience ate it up. Is his definition for masculinity and in the opposite femininity similar to Josh Hawley's, which is like women need to be traditional. We need to go back to traditional households. Women should stay at home, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, so kind of. So I classed... Jordan Peterson in the, I mean, I guess he's, it's good that he's telling men to clean their room instead of their wives. It is. <laughs> it is. But, you know, that was in 2018. He's, like, since gotten kind of weirder and more extreme. Um, and he's sort of joined this, this nebulous cohort of guys on the internet that is known as the manosphere. And I, I refer to them as manfluencers. And Jordan Peterson is almost, like, on the benign side. Like, he gives advice, like, clean your room and stand up straight and, like, occasionally veers into the sort of, like, men are strength and women are agents of chaos. So you know who says that? Mm -hmm. Who says that women are agents of chaos? St. Thomas Aquinas. Yes. Like, that's his whole shtick. Yeah. Yeah, Jordan Peterson is, is throwing it back. He's throwing it back to, so like, literally, back. literally the medieval ages yeah. when people thought that, like, uteruses floated around the body. <laughs> causing and hysteria. Causing hysteria. Yeah. Like, literally. And you know, it's funny because hysterectomy, hysteria, like hysteria. These are Greek words. Yeah, got to get it out there. You know, so it's like, I'm, I, yeah, like it's just, it's very medieval of Peterson to bring back these things of like agents of chaos when at the same time when they're saying like, we need a woman at home, it's like, why do I need a woman at home? To take care of me, to organize me, <laughs> to, to manage the household. The like, so which is it? Are we agents of chaos or are we caregiving, parenting, managing the household yeah yeah and i mean i think he has like sort of tried to make that distinction but then there are there are figures who are much worse than jordan peterson yeah. frankly who have come on the scene like if jordan peterson is benign, annoying yeah or even benign you then have manfluencers like andrew tate you know who for those of you who don't know although i guess so many people have heard of him at this point he's a former MMA fighter who was kicked off of the show Big Brother uh, and then just I did not became, know that he was a reality TV star. Yeah, that's how he started. And he was kicked off the show because a video emerged of him like beating a woman with a belt. Beating a woman with a belt. Yes. And so men are listening to a man mm -hmm. who there's video footage of him beating a woman with a belt. Yeah. I mean, he he styles himself as like the ultimate man in sort of a, a caricature of masculinity. He's like talking about his cars and his women naturally they're like multiple of both you know what um people like andrew tate and the people that like listen to him religiously and i've met people like that who yeah. like swear by andrew tate um 
I always just like my immediate thought, especially whenever I listen to entertain and also Jordan Peterson mm -hmm. and um, it's like Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan. I mean, I mean, Bronze not, not, Age pervert, Joe Rogan's, like, all these Joe Rogan's like nothing compared to these guys. But um, but when I think about these particular two gentlemen, I always think to myself, like, do you even like women or do you, do you just like fucking women? Because there yes. is a place in this world where you can be heterosexual. You like fucking women, but you only enjoy the company of men. Yes. And Andrew Tate, Andrew Tate totally seems like that. Andrew Tate seems like he hates women. He likes fucking women. But he only enjoys the company of men. And, you know, I'm not even sure he likes sleeping with women that much. It's like a status thing. Like you acquire women in the same way that you acquire watches and cars. Right. And now, like, he's actually under arrest in Romania for allegedly being a human trafficker. Like he was collecting girlfriends and making them become cam girls and taking all of their money. So I don't think he likes them very much. But in the absence of better role models, a lot of young men are just following these guys. Like they're watching Andrew Tate and watching Jordan Peterson for advice on how to be a man, which as a woman, that's really frightening. That's that, really scary. That's really, really alarming. And it's, it's not a so good harbinger you, of things when to you, come. When you interviewed all those men um, for your piece this summer, um, what were your, because these are two separate things that now I'm discussing, right? Mm -hmm. There was a piece where you talked about the manfluencer space, and then there was another piece that you did where you asked men on, you know, what does masculine feel to them? Mm -hmm. Or I don't know if that was the question how it was posed. You'll have to correct me. Um, what do you feel like your conclusions were from that conversation? Yeah, well, so the first piece was like this big essay that was actually titled Men Are Lost. Um, and it basically talked about this, right? How so many men feel kind of confused in this current social moment. They're looking for role models. And frankly, the mainstream and a lot of progressives, like for various reasons, some of them understandable, don't really feel comfortable saying that manhood is a thing or that masculinity is a thing or that there's a good way to be a man. They're willing to say like, toxic masculinity is toxic but they're not really providing a positive i'm vision. a big fan of wholesome masculinity yeah. I'm, I'm married to wholesome masculinity I like i'm that. constantly promoting my husband as like an example of like wholesome masculinity. Like a good man like what yeah, a good well, man not, yeah like. i mean and i don't think he's like a prototype for any woman to follow you don't have to like george that's totally fine but like i think of him and i've there's other people that i think of which is like this is wholesome to me right mm -hmm. like and i think what makes someone wholesome is a person who has hobbies a person who has a loyal friend group that they can speak to on a weekly basis and like increase the emotional range of their communication yeah. like have someone to check in on right right not be lonely and perhaps dying a death of despair which is three out of four deaths of despair are men also another sad fact like men are really struggling right now it seems but yeah, I mean, in this piece, like, there is this idea that a lot of men are casting about for, like, how to exist in the world. The mainstream doesn't seem to want to tell them anything. They feel this is, like, their impression. I'm not saying that it's correct, except that being male is toxic and, like, actually they should just kind of become more like their sisters in some way. But, like, when was but the, the last other time? side, yeah. like, there are the people who are willing to say something sort of affirmative about manhood uh -huh. are these guys, Jordan Peterson, Andrew Tate, right. who, like, give sort of a terrible definition of manhood, which is basically just manhood is being opposed to femininity in every right. way, but at least are willing to say, yeah, it's good to be a man. It's exciting. Like there's something specific about masculinity and we'll show you how to get there. And for people are there who any, are lost, are there any women in this space that like, not really. And there's no, there's no one in the vacuum to talk, to teach about like wholesome masculinity. That's the problem. Yeah. There's, there are people who are like, well, you should just, be a good person. Listen to this isn't podcast. That specific. Guys. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Right. No, I That's feel like problem. I feel like there's a big difference in the guys that follow me on Instagram mm -hmm. versus like guys in the wild. Like I cannot the average man. <laughs> no, I'm being serious though. Like I know that like statistic like analytically I've seen my my back end and like 93% of my followers are women, mm -hmm. right? But man, the the guys that DM me, they DM me all the time. Like they are telling me, like, here's what I'm doing, and it's like, it's like so positive, so nice. So I'm like, ooh, this is the gooey center that I want to live in. Like I love meeting the men that yeah. follow me because they all seem wonderful to me. Like they get it. It's not like the me. If whenever I hear what you said before, right, about how some men are like, I don't know how to talk to women. Well, 
get out, you know. You tried talking to a woman? Try talking to a woman. <laughs> like, what do you mean you don't have to talk? Like, what are you going to do? Like, nice boobs you got? That's the first thing that's going to come out of there, like, out of your mouth? Like, in my mind, it's like, okay, if you are listening to this podcast right now and you're like, okay, I'm a man and I want to approach wholesome masculinity, what can I do? You're going to join a co-ed bowling league. Mm. You're going to join a co-ed Toastmasters group. You're going to join some weekly activity that is co-ed that gives you the opportunity to make friends with the opposite sex, not date them, not just fuck them, be just normal be them. normal, be yeah. a human, right? And that one domino, it will change your life. It will, yeah. it will, first of all, you're talking to people weekly, like you have a place to go. You're not lonely, you're outside. What did you yeah. say before? Three you're out of four lonely. men yeah. are dying of despair? Yeah. Like, that's an insane number. It's really scary. If someone said to me that three out of four people were dying from alcohol right now, alcohol would be right back. We would be back in prohibition. Yeah. So I should clarify that deaths of despair is this category um, of deaths that was identified by the Nobel laureate economist Angus Deaton. And it's it's what they use to describe premature death of either alcohol abuse, suicide, or drug overdose. And yeah, so they... Classified. Add like, an opiate are, crisis. Yeah, these are and the add things in some that sad guns. people do. <laughs> I mean, I'm just yeah. wondering, like, because the opiate crisis in the United States is like unreal compared and it's to other countries. Hitting men comparatively right. much harder mm-hmm. than women. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then you also have like lack of gun control in a lot of states right. in this country. Like, I would like to see the stats on like these deaths of despair. The difference between the United States versus like Spain. Well, so that's why... Which like, is a distressed economy, by the way. So that's yeah. like a good example of like, well, this has a high unemployment rate. So like, when you don't have access to certain kinds of drugs and certain kind of weapons... Well, like this is, I mean, this is a side note, but that's the interesting thing. Like, that's why this economist kind of won a Nobel for identifying this, because the phenomenon was like, suddenly people in the US were dying younger, like... The life expectancy was going down. And this wasn't happening in other places that had distressed economies, had problems. It was just the U.S. And so he was like, why is this happening here? What's And it was it's despair. So anyway, I, yeah, <laughs> that's crazy. And so I'm telling you, like, I think that there is this opportunity for if if a man wants to embrace wholesome masculinity, to me, the obvious solution is put yourself in in situations where you have to show up on a weekly basis Mm -hmm. that is co-ed a cooking class toastmasters um tech events uh, an investment course go back to college go do a community 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 college course you know what i mean go learn creative writing out of the house and offline yeah out of the house no zoom events out of the house in front of people join i remember one of my clients he joined a poetry club oh because he wanted to do creative writing and that was yeah. what was available. And I was like, I love that. He, dude, this guy met so many women. But he also, like, became friends with a lot of people. Like, you know, yeah. these are good places to go. No, that makes that makes total sense. But, I mean, this is actually related to – so the second piece. So I wrote this big essay about men are lost, kind of what, what do we do about it. Mm-hmm. And embedded in that essay was just, like, a call out asking people to write in and tell me, like, what what is your ideal of masculinity? Like, if you if you had to draw one in your mind, who is it? And the responses poured in. What were they? Um, there were over 300 of them. And people wrote, like, not just like a sentence or two, but like long multi paragraph essays. And the examples were so wide ranging. It was, there were a lot of Mr. Rogers, like Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. He's hot. But <laughs> that, that, that appeals to me so much. Phil I Dumpy mean, is my, I'm married to Phil oh, Dumpy. He came up too. But yeah. there was like Aristotle, LeBron James, Aristotle, Captain Kirk. <laughs> Aristotle believed. That women were inverted men. I see this as a Greek person. Yes. I will hate on my own people. He believed that women were inverted men, and if men did not have, were not good in this lifetime, that they were they reincarnated women. as women as punishment with an inverted penis. Rough, rough, rough. So for those Aristotle, guys. who you don't even fucking know. Oh come on! That I mean, is such Jesus a was fucking an cop out. No, there were like, and a lot of people just talked Jesus. about like their dad, their grandfather, and the one interesting thing was. That first of all, everyone felt a little bit uncomfortable, like saying like, this is an ideal of masculinity. But once they got rolling, they had like a very clear idea of what like a good man looked like, what good masculine traits looked like. And even out of like all of the different examples, like a really, really wide range of people, there were certain attributes that came up again and again. And it was like 
being reliable, like somebody who, you know, their family and community could depend on to do their duty. I love that. Um, using your strength to defend others, especially the weaker among you, and not to harm people, actually, but and to do good. And that doesn't even be physically. That could be yes. emotionally, financially, right. and spiritually. It was not, yeah. Right. It's not even about, like, being super physically strong. There was a guy who was like, my dad was, like, much smaller than I am, but was incredibly intelligent and, like, did all this stuff to provide for us. Um, there was also, like, being liked by women, actually. Like, somebody who women felt comfortable around, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and, you know, being of good moral character, actually. Like, telling the truth. And it was so interesting that there was such a consensus being a, being a leader, like being a good leader, someone people could look up to, that like people kind of knew what they wanted to be, but they weren't sure of how to get there or what that looked like in today's right. world. I can give you a hack. This is how hmm. I found my husband. I basically wrote down a list of the 15 things I want in a potential partner to have kids with. Like I finished that sentence. Uh -huh. Because when you start thinking about like, so now if, if a if a man is listening to this and you're like, well, you know, what kind of man do I want to be? I want you to think about the kind of father you want to be, mm -hmm. right? And it's going to be all those words you just said. I want to be reliable. I, you know, I want to be maybe physically comforting, emotionally comforting, intellectually um, strong. You know, like there's certain things you're going to put in those things. Like yeah. what if, if you're a man doing this exercise, what if you have a daughter? How much does that, how much does that list change now? Being emotionally intelligent. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So that's what I did to like kind of hone in on like what was important to me because, you know, I, I was interested in having children Yeah. and who I have kids with is not only going to impact me, it's going to impact the kids I bring into this world. Yeah. And that's different from like, what would be fun on vacation? Yeah. The oh, beach. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I need him to only fly business class. I'm like, this does not fucking matter, <laughs> but okay. Um, I guess like I think in like listening to you saying about all these things, I wonder, you know, now for you, Christine, like personally, like, is there a fictional character that you think? Because you know what I notice mm -hmm. when I think about like fictional characters on TV and growing up, there was a time in the late 80s, early 90s where we had really strong father figures on TV. Right. Because of TGIF. Right. We had and I'm, I'm yeah. just saying I'm just saying the character. I'm not saying the actor, but like. The Cosby Show that had a really mm -hmm. strong father figure. Um, family Matters, Mr. Winslow, right? Yes. Yeah. The fact that you yeah. know Family Matters just blessed. I watched it. Um, oh my God, Mr. <laughs> Winslow. And then you had the Full House father, mm -hmm. um, but Bob Saget playing the father figure. Like you had three really strong father figures, and then fast forward twenty years later, and it's like Mario Lopez is the father figure. Like half of his plot lines are him being a fuck up. Right. And this was something I mentioned with like the lack of role models, even in popular culture, like dads are kind of like stupid. Huh. They're <laughs> they, so like, dumb. On the couch or dumb. And I and hate that. It's like, no, I don't, I don't think of my father as a dumb person. I think of my father as like a person I can rely on who's, the, you know, the stay in his house will always be free. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, I can go to him when I have a problem. But if like, if I know like people could say, oh, that's just TV, but no, I think TV teaches us, teaches like, us. Right. Watch. And you know what? It's funny. I say that because in the fifties, the, the U S government, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if it was U S government or some nonprofit, but there was, there was these black and white commercials you can find on YouTube that came out in the fifties huh. that because a lot of men were growing up in fatherless households because maybe they lost their dads in the world wars. Um, they were making these videos where it was showing men how to ask out a woman on a date. That's so fascinating. And like, here's what not to do. And then here's what to do. And it's like, they're just showing you in action, not saying it to you. So it's like, Billy could say, I'm picking you up at seven. You better be ready. Or he can call her and be like, hey, would you like to go to the movies on Friday at 7 p.m.? Hmm. You know, like, you know, showing men how to be men, right? Yeah. So then I just, I'm constantly, I'm constantly shocked when I watch TV. It's like, when are you going to show me fathers? I mean, I have the same problem with Blackish. Whenever I watch Blackish, I'm literally waiting until the plot line shows me that the father is not did something wrong. He's a mess. He's a total mess. He's a mess. Yeah. And it's like, why am I only encountering put together women? Yeah. And like, is it a reflection of the time or is it informing the time? Like both. I, think. I don't know. I guess we'll just have to get Chuck Lore on here. We'll have to answer to. <laughs> 
Because I mean, he, him, and Bill Lawrence have created like a lot of the sitcoms the, that the we Empire see, right? Sitcoms. And I yeah. think that's why um, I feel like one of the reasons why Ted Lasso is so popular. He, was, he also came up a lot in right. responses, right? Yeah. Ted Lasso. By the way, if you ever go on the Reddit for Ted Lasso, all you see is people say how Ted Lasso changed their lives. Mm -hmm. And I am one of those people. Like when Ted Lasso came out, my mom got like really sick. Like to me, how sick she was, it felt like a mountain. It's like, how am I going to even like clear this obstacle? Right. Yeah. And watching Ted Lasso, just like, I remember the, my brain chemistry like shifted Aww. and like thinking about like, just take it one day at a time. And then we're going to take it one week at a time. Like I never had that sort of mentality before. Yeah. And I think one of the reasons why Ted Lasso is just so popular that it is, is because almost all the characters being showcased are a version of what I think is wholesome masculinity. Mm -hmm. I mean, towards the end, and this is not, I'm not trying to like spoiler alert or anything, but did you watch Ted Lasso? I have not watched <gasps> the last season. Okay. Then I can't tell you this. You can just I, like it's okay, but there. Okay, this is not this is not spoiled. ruining this is not ruining anything. Okay, this is really not ruining anything. But like in season three, you see this relationship that Roy Kent has with Jamie, and with Keely that you are convinced towards the end of the season that oh this is going to become a throuple. <laughs> okay, because these men show love to each other mm -hmm. that they're willing to not even fight over a woman. They're just like we'll let her choose, but I'm. Like, it just kind of leaves with, like, oh, is she going to choose both? Because these men love each other. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, Ted Lasso is an example of wholesome masculinity. Anytime there is toxic masculinity, anytime you see this version of, like, oh, I'm going to be a player, it's frowned upon not only by the show itself, like, the writers, but the characters within. Like, so yeah. there's this instance in season three where um, the guy who used to own – but, you know, the ex-husband, mm -hmm. he's trying to get he's trying to get his new coach to cheat on his girlfriend. Like he's trying to give him this opportunity. Like he's like pushing yeah. these women on him. And he's like, well, I don't want to cheat on my girlfriend. So he just like leaves the party prematurely. And then you see him that he quits his job over this, oh, that he has to, to heal from this. And I'm just like, this show is amazing. Like if you are a man and you want to understand what wholesome masculinity looks like, Watch here it is. And I love that it's a sports show. Because I think there is sport athletes do have a bad rep. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, and I'm not saying that Ted Lasso is an accurate portrayal of this life, <laughs> right? Just as much as Bill Cosby is not a portrayal, an accurate portrayal of households in Brooklyn yeah, in the 80s. Fair. But it is something that an audience can see and strive for. It is. And one of the things that's interesting, too, about... Ted Lasso being the example. And one of the things that I noticed, like in reading the response to this piece, is that men want to learn from other men. Right. I, like I can write a piece as a woman about masculinity, but men are not asking women, women how to be it. a good man. Yeah. <laughs> they want to hear from other men. I'd love to meet the man that stalked you the way I stalked your Washington Post <laughs> articles. Um, Do I want to meet him? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm mixed on that. But... Yeah, I mean, I think men are interested in what women think because a lot of them want to get with women and want to know what women want. But in talking to men and hearing from them and talking to experts on this, like, it does seem that men learn more by showing, by just, like, seeing someone else being a good person, seeing someone else who they respect calling out a guy who's doing a bad thing, than just, like, being told, like, do this, not that. And they they do want to hear from other men. So Ted Lasso kind of fits that perfectly. Did Ron Swanson come up? Yes. And uh, Ben? Who's Ben? Uh, Leslie Nopes. Oh, that guy. Ben Wyatt. You know, no, it was when when that show came up, it was Ron Swanson. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I think like having a skill of some kind was also a thing that came up a lot. Who's your um, oh, yeah. character crush? So I'm a huge nerd. Um, and It's I Loki. <laughs> I can tell it's Loki. It's Loki, isn't it? No, oh, no, okay. no, no, no. It's, it's more nerdy. So there is... Um, this series of British novels for boys uh, called Horatio Hornblower. <laughs> okay. Uh, and like the BBC did a mini series, a Horatio Hor Hornblower mini series featuring Yoan Griffith that came out like in the 90s. And I borrowed these from the library when I was a kid and just became obsessed with Horatio Hornblower. And so he's like a young man who joins the King's Navy during the Napoleonic Wars and like 
learns how to sail and goes on adventures and like supports his friend and gets into fights with the guy who's cheating at cards. How old are we talking here? How old are you in this situation? I was probably like 11. Dude, this is like... This you is were a, reading this that is 11. You know what I was reading? I was reading Fear Street by R.L. Stein. <laughs> this is why I'm fucked up. Keep going. Well, I watched the miniseries before I read the books. And the books were for children. But no, it's like just this like noble young man of good character. I who love like it. helps his friends and rescues ladies and then rises to become a captain in the British Navy. And I was like, right. this is a man. This is a man. He can like climb the mm. mast and also dance with women. I love right. that. And so Horatio Hornblower. <laughs> For me, I will say it was um, Bill Cosby on The Cosby Show. Interesting. Like, What about him? The character again. Yeah, of course. I always have to like iterate this. Um, I, he's married to this big time lawyer. Mm -hmm. Um, They have all these kids. They have a shitload of kids. They do have a lot of kids. And they're all different ages. (laughs) So this woman just never catching a break, okay? But she's still working. But she's working. She's a lawyer. She's working hard. Yeah. And he's working. And they're just, like, supporting each other. And they're just, like, on the same page. And I'm just like, yeah, I think that there is a place where, like, I remember before I met my spouse, like, thinking, like, there is this place, and maybe it's a make-believe place, but I believe that there's this place where a man has his career and he's secure with himself that I'm going to have a career mm-hmm. and we will raise children together with really strong work ethic. Yeah. And so when I made that list that I was telling you about, like, here's the 15 characters, you know, some of it kind of looks like Bill Cosby, like the character again. Look, it's not my <laughs> fault. All right. He named the character after himself. What do you want me to do? Yeah. Wait, no, his, okay. You know, Bill Hux, uh, Huxtable? Huxtable. Why am I saying Cosby this whole time? Because, like, we all associate the Cosby show. Because like, it's not the Huxtable show. Yeah. It's the Cosby show. Right. So I think of that character. And I think of, like, okay, he's reliable. He likes he likes that I have my own career. He is supportive. He's not threatened by my glory. You know, he... He's very funny. He, he, yeah. <laughs> he is really funny. And he's yeah. goofy. And he laughs at himself. Like, he doesn't have this ego in the show. And again, I always have to say, because I once said that to someone and they got like really offended that Mm -hmm. I would still like this show. But it's like, I understand how you feel. Just like I still will tap my foot to a Michael Jackson song. Right. Right. But this doesn't take away that like that was a really popular show once that still for someone of that age consuming it, it had a massive impact on how I view men. Yeah. Yeah. The values that you wanted to see emulated. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. And of course, I'm in the generation of TGIF, so it only got, I feel like it got reinforced. You know, then I had Mr. Winslow, Bob Saget, like I had these like male figures that like, I don't know, I would really struggle. Like I really like Modern Family because it shows you different versions of families. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really love Phil Dumphy. I love that character. I think like he's such a solid character. I know some of the plot lines include him being really silly, yeah. but he's never a mess. He's a stand up guy. Yeah, yeah, he's reliable. He's, he's a good father. You know, and and that's what I was like. I was like, I think this is what I'm looking for. But I I find it so fascinating that yours started at 11. Yeah. I mean, I don't know that I like knew. But you still remember. It becomes like a core memory. It becomes like this imprint of like what you're looking for. Right. So then let me ask you a personal question then. Sure. Which I mean, that was a personal (laughs) question. But like, do you find that like, do you feel like that version of the man that you read when you were 11, this knight in shining armor sort of guy, this leader, is this who you've been looking for in dating? Have you ever thought about this? I have thought about it. I I don't think it's a knight in shining armor thing that I'm looking for because I also am not necessarily like a damsel who needs to be saved from the Spanish Armada or like whatever he was doing. <laughs> sure. But there is still something about like a a person of like really strong character who is like decisive and capable Ah. like get stuff done Uh who's intelligent like yeah i guess i'm still looking for a horatio hornblower okay it sounds like you're looking for a planner are you a planner in your circle group are you the planee no that's the thing i'm also i feel like i'm looking for someone who is complimentary in areas where i'm not so i'm like not a good planner there you go you just like we just found it so that's it you're the planee we gotta find you a planner yeah let, let me know. <laughs> I'll let you know. Thank you again for coming to the Ask a Matchmaker podcast. This conversation has been so illuminating. I really appreciate I you. I've loved being here. Thank you. And I heard you launched a Substack. 
I did. Christinemba.substack.com. It's where I'm just going to be publishing my thoughts that don't make it into the post and maybe some hints into big projects, next book, stuff like that. I love that. And you're based out of DC. I am based in DC. Yes. All right. So we got to hit up. We got to hit up DC. We got to support Christine on when, whenever her WAPO articles come out. And also her new Substack. I will include the link to your Substack in Thank the show you. notes. That way people know where to get. So they can become obsessed with you like I'm obsessed with you. <laughs> All of my hot takes because and silliest you're, Yeah, thoughts. because they're fun. Like, you know what it is? Like, it's like illuminating. You are having these competitions that I'm not having, you know? Like, and it's just like they're open with you. So I love that. Yeah, it's it's been fascinating. I feel really grateful to the people who are willing to share, like, really intimate parts of their lives with me. Amazing. Thanks again for coming. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for listening and watching, because this is on YouTube now, uh, the Ask a Matchmaker podcast. I'm your host, Matchmaker Maria. If you don't follow me on Instagram, you should, at Matchmaker Maria. You know this podcast also has an Instagram where we have really fun clips. You should follow that too, at Ask a Matchmaker. And of course, if you enjoyed this episode, you should subscribe. Be lovable, but more importantly, be likable. See you next week.